This is Doug Cook. I live on what was Pawtucket land and currently known as South Hamilton, Massachusetts, near the Great Marsh in the Ipswich River watershed. Welcome everyone to Building Soil in the Garden with Sharon Gensler. We're excited to learn more about all those no-till practices that build soil in the garden. Before we get started, I want to thank all of our NOFA Mass staff and board members who have helped to make this workshop possible. Our sponsors tonight, Chelsea Green Publishing, an employee-owned company, brings in-depth practical content about organic gardening and more to life with books, ebooks, and audiobooks. Go to chelseagreen.com and enter code PWEB35 at checkout to receive a special NOFA Mass Resilient Garden Series discount on your next print book purchase. Chelsea Green Publishing, cultivating change from the ground up. As well, Ward's Nursery. They pride themselves on being a leader in offering horticultural products you can count on, knowledgeable staff you can trust, and friendly customer service. Ward's Nursery and Garden Center, where gardeners grow, located in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And Neptune's Harvest, organic fertilizers, products from the ocean to set your plants in motion. Enter code NOFA10 at checkout for 10% off your order between March 9th and April 9th this year at neptunesharvest.com. Of course, most importantly, we wanna thank you, the viewers and listeners, especially our members who make our education and advocacy work possible. Please consider becoming a member and or making a donation to support our important work. We always like to start our events with a moment to for you all to locate yourself on this map, um, which we will share in the chat as well. And we hope that you're able to consider learning more about the history of indigenous people who once resided and managed the land where you are living. We also wanna learn about their present day political structures, issues, and goals. We suggest that you learn more about the ongoing history of black exclusion from property and farmland ownership as well. Please consider making solidarity work with local Black and Indigenous groups a part of your environmental and land-based work. We owe so much of what we know about how to grow food and manage land in a way that is regenerative and ecologically responsible, not only to people who were here before colonization, but the people who were brought to the United States as slaves. And rather than erase them, we should honor them and support them and seek justice for the descendants who have survived centuries of oppression and white supremacy. We will share some more links for you to learn more and follow organizations who are doing this important work. In this moment, I just wanna acknowledge and express my gratitude to everyone for sharing this space together. I encourage you to focus on your breath and feel the connection with your body and the place that you're in. And with that, I'm very excited to introduce Sharon Gensler, our presenter tonight. Sharon has been an organic gardener and homesteader and educator for over 40 years and has grown and preserved the bulk of the vegetables and fruit for her family. She's enjoyed, or sorry, she's employed healthy soil building practices, including no-till techniques and has successfully devised ways to incorporate small scale cover cropping into a garden setting. All right, Rafi, I mean, uh, Sharon, when you're ready, you can take over a screen share. Well, thank you all for coming, um, giving up a, a beautiful evening. I don't know where you're living, but here where I am is just gorgeous and it's hard to be inside. Um, I'm going to show you a, a series of slides from around my homestead, just as I give you a brief introduction about myself so that you can have a sense of what, um, what I'm talking about in the sense of place of, of where I am. So. I, I was uh, raised on a small family farm in upstate New York and we did tractors and we did tilling. And so in 1980, I was um, gifted some land here in, I'm gonna move this so I don't have, I can reach the buttons and uh, I'll be jiggling a little, so sorry about that. Um, anyway, when I got this land, it was fully wooded, uh, rocky hillside and was very um, daunting to start thinking about what I was going to be do doing to can't find that button kids, there it is, sorry, um, to, to figure out how to make this a productive farm because as Doug said, I really wanted to be able to grow our own food for the family. Uh, luckily at the time I was working at the New England Small Farm Institute and uh, we had some a gentleman called named Bill Mollison, who is one of the co-founders of 
um, permaculture come to visit the farm. And it was like walking around with him to um, just totally turn my ideas of, of what to look at uh, on end. It was mind blowing. Um, so taking his ideas of permaculture and putting them into practice along with what the readings I had been doing of John, I'm having a hard time with this button, um, with John Jevons and French intensive growing with using wide beds and permanent beds without walking on them all came together. And so uh, after clearing the land, there was about a half an inch of forest duff and the concept, permaculture concept of building soil by going up was what I ended up being, uh, sorry for my distraction with these buttons, they're just not working for me. Um, building soil from the, from the ground up rather than going down. And after years, we now have at least 10 to 12 inches of really beautiful friable soil with all kinds of abundant fruits, vegetables, and flowers. Um, and the one thing that it's come about is now this is called regenerative agriculture, regenerative growing. But when I started, it was just trying to figure out how to make, make soil and make food. And it's just been incredible that the conditions kept me from getting the tractor that I lusted after. I did try a road, rototiller, rented one once, and I almost lost the fillings in my teeth. And so it was just too rough of a place to use. And so coming up with other ways has in the long run given us uh, this healthy soil and full of microbes and um, growing really healthy crops. So out of the midst of uh, trauma has abundance. Anyway, this is the look out the window from my house. And a lot of people looked at that garden. This is the main part of the vegetable garden and thought, what a mess. But actually it's a planned diversity and diversity in all of our growing is really essential to uh, getting healthy food. And this is a picture in May. Uh, and I just wanted to show you what the beds would look like of having a three, three to four foot um, wide bed that rarely ever gets walked on and has paths. And that one bed that, that I was showing you also is the only bare soil that you could see in that picture because I was just getting ready to plant. So I took off the mulch that had been there. Um, there we are again. So let's get into this what we're going to be talking about tonight. Mostly I'm going to uh, stress uh, soil uh, micro, uh, micro life and I'm going to talk about um, cover crops and no-till primarily. A little bit about carbon sequestration because we're in the midst of a crisis, a climate crisis, and the healthier our soil, the healthier uh, we can make our environment because we can sequester carbon. There's a lot, a lot of information on the NOFMS website uh, that staff have put together. So if you want to go dive into carbon sequestration, that's where I'd recommend that you go. So how do we get from this picture on the left to the picture on the right? Um, that's what I'm hoping to talk about tonight. This I took uh, in April a few years back, and it's that dark chocolate crumb, the cake. Uh, looks like chocolate cake, and that's what we really want in our soil. Again, a biologically healthy soil, which is rich in microbial life, produces vegetables with a higher nutrient value, and produces flowers and vegetables with more vibrant colors and a longer shelf life, uh, things with more intense flavors and aromas, and it also, it decreases pests and disease pressure in the garden, as well as um, sequestering carbon. This is just a little brief uh, re review of the, the carbon dioxide cycle. We all know that the atmosphere, that uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, a lot is produced by grow by fossil fuels, and we do try to cut back and eliminate that. And that is a major problem, but the 
second major problem is agriculture and putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So we want to increase the health of the greenery, the trees and the, and the uh, plant life because they will pull, uh, they, they breathe in the carbon and make through photosynthesis and put it uh, into the soil through the plant roots. And we're going to talk in detail about that. And if we keep that cycle going with really healthy soil, we can not only have it at the le level where plant roots are for, for their healthy growth, but it also to the level deeper in where it's um, sequestered. And again, uh, this material is all available for later viewing. And I see on the internet a lot in the papers that uh, people want to spend in, uh, corporations want to have billion dollar machines to take carbon out of the atmosphere and, and put it down in the oceans or wherever they want to put it. In actuality, all it takes is keeping our earth covered with soil. Uh, this is just a, a simple drawing of keeping keeping green things on the soil. And you can see a, a small layer of leaves and other decaying <clears throat> organic matter. And then you can see the roots going down deep through a good soil structure that has aggregates and airways and ways for water to move through and ways for the worms and it's not compacted. And this is our goal. Uh, I think it might've been sixth grade that I learned about photosynthesis but I never learned, and I don't know if they just didn't know then as much as they do now, but besides using sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, green living things make uh, the su simple sugars that they use for their growth, but they also make a lot of other chemicals and uh, they dump up to 60% of this that they're producing into the soil. And it makes you stop and think of if you were, if you were uh, tithing yourself back to your community, giving back 60% of what you produce or at your income would be really a challenge unless there was some something going on. And what we're going to talk about is the symbiosis that's happening that the plants are giving uh, into the soil for the microbes to use to create better healthy soil. So uh, with so many of you, I couldn't ask how many are gardeners before, or have you ever gardened or not? And I'm assuming that many of you have and are avid gardeners and some may be totally new. So, um, but I wanna just do some of the basics here, but in a teaspoon of healthy soil, it just contains billions of creatures, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, et cetera. And many of these are beneficial and many are aren't as beneficial to us and to plants, but what we want to do is cultivate the most beneficial things that will help us uh, and that will help those microbes make nutrients that are bioavailable to our plants. So th this is just a internet stolen picture that you can see on the far left, uh, there's not much greenery, so there's not much roots. And on the far right, there's a lot of greenery and the huge root mass and those plants are dumping a lot of sugars into the soil that uh, are depicted here as cookies and things that the microbes can, can digest and make use of. <clears throat> so first, uh, I'm gonna talk mostly about uh, two things, bacteria and fungi. And the bacteria are our main decomposers and without them, we wouldn't be able to do much in the way of, um, we would be buried in thousands of feet of trash because things need to decompose as part of the life cycle. So um, that's what they're doing. They're, they're living in the soil and they're decomposing and they're making, taking organic matter and turning it into, helping turn it into soil. Uh, one of them that I wanna talk about just for a second is the rhizo rhizobium, which are, uh, that help legume plants fix nitrogen. So I think many of you who do garden probably have bought little packets of uh, inoculant, which is a little black powder that you put on your pea or bean seeds before you plant them. And that is a um, bacterium and that they uh, help. It's right there at the root level of, this, of the plant when it germinates. And they will help that plant take nitrogen out of the air 
and fix it into uh, the soil. So when you think about buying fertilizer and buying all kinds of soil amendments, uh, it's really not necessary when we have these little creatures doing it for us uh, because our atmosphere is a huge amount of nitrogen in it. So this, this photo, uh, photo uh, I'd like to really spend a little time with. That's a, a pine seedling and it's really hard to tell, but um, that whole mass of fibrous things at first looking at it, I thought, oh my God, look at the root structure for that little plant. And in actuality, it, those are the mycelium and fungal hyphae from uh, various soil fungus. And um, the roots are actually the little golden, uh, light brown colored thick stem things. So you can see according for the amount of root volume compared to the mycorrhizal uh, fungal volume, it's tremendous increase. And so by having these creatures living in our soil, um, they are a transportation system and they are a communication system. And so they're helping that plant root uh, communicate to other plants because it's not just one little seedling there. The earth is covered. Uh, if you leave nature to her own devices, there'll be a thousand pine seedlings or mixed other plants growing there and not bare soil. And all of this mycorrhizal intermesh with each other uh, and, and connect. So communication from this little seedling can go a great distance. And um, if it needs a nutrient during the photosynthesis process as it's making its sugars and chemicals, it can also send a chemical down through the root system saying, uh, I need, I'm anthropomorphic, whatever, it's, you know, putting it in human terms, but I need some boron in order to, to really uh, grow right at this point, and I don't have any that's available to me. That goes out through that mycorrhizal communication system until some boron is located, and then it's transported back through the same system and is made bioavailable to that plant. And so once you have a balance in your soil and you have these creatures living in symbiosis to your, your plants that you've planted, you um, don't have to import you don't have to import um, nutrients and buy soil amendments and everything. And in the beginning, I did do soil tests and I did apply various uh, amendments that I thought was needed. But after this system gets going, they can go way down to the subsoil and mine for you the nutrients that the plants are needed. So I want you to try to remember this picture for a minute because I'm gonna get back to it in a few seconds and I'd like you to keep that in your mind if you can. This is just another um, picture of mycorrhizal uh, hyphae and, and mycelium. And the, the big blunt object on the left is the tip of a root hair. And so they're just, uh, they, they penetrate through the roots and are surround them uh, and they go penetrate this root and then they'll penetrate the root of the plant next to them. And so communication is very <clears throat> quick and also the absorptive uh, areas is, is much increased. The other thing that's really urgently important for a healthy soil is to have soil aggregates. And that's uh, like a clay soil, you would have just this fine silt that makes it like a hard pan. And the sandy soil, you would have large sand granules. And, and you don't want either of those. You want something where you can take a handful of soil, damp soil and squeeze it and open your hand and it stays together, but then you, it would crumble if you touched it. Um, like again, that you want that chocolate cake feel to it and look to it. And to get that soil aggregate, because the, the aggregates are uh, important on a lot of levels. It allows air and moisture to move through the soil as well as uh, worms and other creatures. And it allows, um, uh, it's a place for bacteria and other soil microorganisms to hang out and be safe. And all, as all of these creatures live, they have short lives and they live and die. And every time they're dying, they're adding to the, the organic matter in the soil and to the, to the nutrients that are available for those plants to take up. So what makes the aggregates? It's, it's something called glomalin, which is the glue that holds soil particles together. And this is uh, also very important because 
that glue is able to store carbon for a long term. I've read 40 years, I've read 100 years. So it's really important to get those. And, it, and it, the glomalin is produced by fungi. So make our soil fungus happy. And they, you, they fungus love um, um, a really rough kind of the stalks of plants and wood chips and things like that the, uh, to eat, to digest. So you don't wanna have just, you wanna have a lot of that available for them to be digested. <clears throat> so we wanna maximize photosynthesis. And we've talked about that. Um, so this is my diversity cake. And I like to think of soil as having layers like this, of, of everybody has a home where they're happy, you know, they have the right conditions to, to live and thrive and, and be, be really um, actualize their potential as microorganisms. So think of the two-year-old and it smashes that cake. It kind of makes a mess of things. It's kind of like uh, a tornado or a hurricane comes through. It, it demolishes the, the, your, the physical structures that may kill life. It, it'll destroy your communication system and your um, uh, food transport system and all kinds of things. So if you think back to that photo of the, the mycelium around the pine roots, think of a rototiller going through that or think of just even the garden fork going through, the, through this and how it would churn it all up and make everybody who's in their little habitat flipped upside down. And so it takes a long time for um, after that hurricane for us to build our structures again, for us to get back to a healthy society. So the same with our soil structure, it takes a long time for, for all those little microbes and for the roots and everything to get back to a healthy place where they can really do their job. So. We want to keep we want to keep that greenery. We want to have, see the dark chocolatey color. And we want to see roots going really deep, and we don't want to mess with them unless we really have to. Um, and I know I've been told no till is great, but let's talk about reduced tillage, and that's true. So sometimes you might need to use a rototiller or or uh, turn your soil if there's some persistent something that you really need to get rid of. But in addition, there are other ways to do some of those things. Um, and what I like to say is, is start small. If some of these things sound like they're overwhelming to you, and oh my God, I can't really do that, or my partner won't put their tiller away, how am I gonna do it? Take a small part of your garden and practice and experiment with no-till, experiment with cover crops and heavy mulching, and you'll see the results and it will win over those who are wedded to their tiller. So uh, there's benefits of no-till. Uh, we've already talked about most of it. Erosion control and also the carbon sequestration. But one other thing is weed suppression. There's a lot of dormant weed seeds deeper in the soil. And when you pull them up uh, through tilling, they, they germinate and sprout and they're a, a problem. And you can really do away with a lot of your weeds by this kind of technique, save a lot of time and energy. So how do you get rid of, uh, what, are, what techniques can we use besides tilling? The one is solarization. And if you have really tender, young sprouted weeds or plants you don't want, you could put a piece of clear plastic on it and then uh, let it sit in the sun for 24 hours, no longer than 48, because we don't want to kill the microorganisms and it'll fry those little suckers. Um, but for heavy, heavier and more persistent um, weeds, you need to do something a little bit uh, more by keeping the sun off of them. So uh, again, this is not my picture, but I stole it from the internet. And it, if you wait, uh, keep the sun and water off of um, your bed for three to six weeks, it will kill most of the, the hardier weeds. Things like dandelion and dock and all are going to take a lot more than that. But um, I am one who likes to, to eat most of that stuff. And I also see, think that they're really good for the, for the garden. Um, also, so the, the next method is a, a lasagna type method, method. And this picture, again, from the internet is really excessive and no one I know would ever do that. 
but I'm going to show you what I do in just a minute. But it's it's basically layering organic matter into uh, putting down cardboard and then layering organic matter. So full di disclosure, this soil, this beautiful 10, 12 inch soil in my homestead, we sold it in April last year and moved up the hill because of my aging body to a flat piece of, piece of land and had to start over. And my partner Prue is in charge of fruit trees, fruit. So she had planted fruit trees about five years ago. So in the orchard area, the new orchard area, we had to put garden beds, which is a great permaculture technique. So here she is mowing down some of the cover crop that was around the orchard. And then we put uh, a lot of cardboard down. And then uh, organic matter, we had been gathering it. We have a big pile of compost that we had delivered from a uh, local compost place. And um, wood chips, we try to get hard wood chips if we can, and a year or two ahead of time so that the fungal growth can start and be there to ready to inoculate the beds. We get moldy hay from a horse farm near us. And these buckets, these buckets are fantastic humanure from our compost toilet. This stuff is three to four years old and there's no uh, chance of any kind of human pathogen being alive after one year. Though because of the squeamish factor, we still didn't put it in food growing um, vegetable areas. We put made beds for blueberry bushes and things. So here we are making new beds. Uh, to keep moving along here, I'll run out of time. Um, this is a bed that was made uh, in April. Um, and it says, you know, if you want to plant in it, you're supposed to wait three to six weeks. Well, we didn't have three to six weeks, but we did. We had a little, but we also, um, right along the trellis, I made a trench and I filled it with compost and put the seeds in it. And they germinated just beautifully. And here's the same bed uh, in September. And it was an amazing amount of crop that we got out of uh, a garden bed that didn't exist before. So because I love to have lots of vegetables, we needed more than the few beds we could fit in the orchard. So we now have four 30 foot long, uh, three to four feet wide beds. And a friend came over with his little tractor to help put some of those uh, layer that so we didn't have to do it all by hand. And because this was brand new, I did add some soil amendments. Uh, and I don't know exactly what that is off the top of my head, but if someone wants to know, I could let you know, but you would want to do your own soil test and go from there. So again, this is layering wood chips and compost and um, uh, there was some well rotted manure also. So the next thing I did was immediately as those beds were being built, I put down some cover crop right on top of the wood chips and then spread some uh, mulch hay over the top of thin layer. And this is, uh, we did this, uh, I just looked it up, August 28th. And the, because it's summer and, and it was uh, beautiful weather, they started germinating immediately. And here it is, um, you know, a month or two later. And by the time winter came, it was probably two feet high or so. So this is a cover crop of mixed cover crop of, uh, and we'll get into details on cover crop shortly. I just wanted to show you that that something could be built, immediately planted into. And here this is photosynthesizing so that this spring I can be able to plant in these beds uh, with a really uh, nice soil to start with. All right, so the other part of no-till is mulch, 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 uh, where, where you, wherever possible have green living uh, growing matter for that photosynthesis, but where you can't, and put down some mulch. It does all of the same things as we've been talking about. about it keeps your soil nice and warm and uh, moderates the soil temperature. You have to pull it off in early spring if you want to plant to warm the soil up because it'll keep it cool. But otherwise, you know, you put it on or you put it off depending on the needs. Um, but mostly it's decomposing slowly, feeding your microbes and your worms and all kinds of good creatures your soil. So the hand tool that I got in 1979 is still with me is a, a broad fork. 
And I used to use it a lot to fluff that soil down in the garden where it was just starting uh, because we didn't have a tractor. We didn't have that many piles of, of really good <laughs> material. So I was starting with, without much money and with a lot more youth. And uh, so the, our layers were thinner, but we tried to get down to this, the subsoil and loosen it with using the, the so you want to loosen it. You never want to turn it because those, those mycorrhizae and mycelium get broken up by, by uh, even using a broad fork too roughly. And if you don't have one of those expensive tools, just a garden fork uh, aerating the soil, just loosening it up slightly. So I'm talking really fast here because I don't have a lot of time and hopefully we'll have good questions afterwards and you've got really all of this material to go back to and look at the whole slideshow or just the notes. Um, so we're going to talk about cover crops, which I thought, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 years ago, why can farmers have cover crops and I'm a gardener and I don't know anything, why can't I use cover crops? And so I said, okay. And so I started using it just a little bit here and a little bit there. And I'll tell you, uh, it, it really has changed my life. I have been able to take out of production uh, probably over a quarter of my garden beds no longer being used every year for food because the soil was so healthy. It was producing more abundantly on um, a same space. And so I put cover crops in and then I'd rotate which beds were growing vegetables and which beds were growing cover crops. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit about a green manure because that's confusing to people. Green manure is something that will get, if you use the same kind of seeds that you're planting, but what you do is you kill them and most farmers would turn it under. Um, and then if you turn it under, you have to wait two to four weeks because it, it uh, in decomposition process heats the soil too much to plant in, in it. But what you would do is, uh, I use a hand tool and I'll show you in a minute, uh, cut that off after it's two or <clears throat> to four inches tall. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, lay it back down in the bed as a, as a mulch. <clears throat> and you, then you could put the uh, solarize that and it will kill it so it doesn't come back. That will give you a nitrogen hit for anything that really needs nitrogen right away so that you don't have to go out and buy nitrogen while you're waiting for your legumes to make it for you. But the cover crop is for your long-term soil. We want long-term soil health to be building up over, over the year and over the years. And, you, so, and it gives us a much larger root mass at the end of the day. Uh, and it gives us a lot of biomass that we can use either as, as uh, in our compost pile or as mulch. Um, and I'm gonna go through all of the different cover crops that I use. And I wanna just say to the thing about the turning the, the green manure under, most farmers, many farmers, I should say, use a, um, a winter rye, which is a fantastic cover crop. It has major roots and it does really good work, but it can become a soil weed and a pest if you don't turn it under or kill it at the exact right time. Uh, and I've never gotten that timing. And so I don't use anything that is a perennial or anything that will not die with our winter cold. So I only use things that winter kill and we'll go into detail on all of those. So here's the benefits of a cover crop and they're almost identical to the no-till and they go hand in hand. Uh, a couple that are different is you can use it as a living mulch uh, instead of just putting regular other mulch down. It does pretty much everything else. And it also helps uh, with the disease and pest control. It's a really amazing how much that cover crops can help with that. So back when I was saying about dandelions and dock and things, um, I love this picture. It shows soil aggregate. You can see, you know, big, like they're little tiny clumps, but they're clumps in that soil. But the thing that I love about it is whatever this plant was that had, is just the root where the root used to be. Um, if you take a little tool and cut off your weeds, your vegetables when they're done producing, anything, if you cut it off at the soil instead of pulling those out, you're doing such benefit for your soil. 
So I came to this conclusion many years ago after I didn't get my garden put to bed in the fall fully. And I went out in the spring and started pulling those big fat broccoli stalks that were left. And the worms just dripped off that, those, those uh, the, you know, the roots in the soil. And uh, I was going, why am I doing this? Those worms need food. And the soil microbes later, didn't know about soil microbes at that point really, uh, they need food too. So if you cut off um, all of your plant matter at the soil, those roots will decay, feed the soil, feed your microorganisms. They also become, become a passage for air and water um, deeper into the soil. And also here's another little plant making use of them. So that would be one small thing you might want to start thinking about doing. Um, so I'm on a homestead, uh, so it's not just a garden. I use these cover crops everywhere I can, in the orchard, the pasture. I don't have a lawn, but if I did, why not? Um, and we're going to go through each of these things. So here's just a little bit of bare soil at the end of an onion bed. And um, so I threw in a handful of, of mixed, looks like uh, buckwheat and oats. And here it is, August 1st. So they were probably planted four or five days earlier. And now here it is. Uh, well, I can't see because your faces are in the way, but it's two, it's like a week later. Um, and they've already gotten big enough that they're shading the soil and they are uh, doing the photosynthesis that is putting nutrients into the soil that those onions can make use of. So bare soil, when there's bare soil, I want to say oxidizes, but I don't think that's the word, but the carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere from bare soil. But if you have living plants on it, as that carbon dioxide leaves the soil, who's right there to take it in and use it to photosynthesize? Those plants are keeping it from going into the atmosphere. So stop bare soil at all costs. So like I said, I took some of my beds out and I keep them in cover crop all year long. I'll start planting early in April, um, early in the year, like mid to late April, depending on the season. And just keep, keep that bed covered in cover crops. Um, I'm just gonna go through and show you, a, a, this, this was a bed after I pulled garlic out at the end of July. Here it is, the end of August. That's probably a foot tall mixed cover crop. And on the right, it's uh, September. Uh, so it's, it's another month. Well, it's actually only two weeks and it's, it's already uh, over three feet tall. It's the same bed. Um, here it is again with that yardstick in October. And it was probably six feet. Uh, it was over my head, over, over the top of my hand when I held it up in the air. Then we get several nights of 20 degrees and it just all dies back. So six to seven feet of biomass above the soil. Oops, wrong way. Uh, and then it dies back. And here I have 10 to 12 inches on the left of free mulch for overwintering my crop. I didn't have to buy it. I didn't have to carry it in. I didn't have to spread it. It just fell over. And I live near the woods, in the woods. And so the leaves blew in and the stubble from that cover crop um, trapped the wheat the leaves and so I have more mulch for the winter. And here we are in December uh, at the same, same time, but this is a, a forage radish and they'll live a little bit longer, but um, they will be dead by um, a, a few more weeks of really cold weather. And we'll talk about each of these crops. Another way I use the cover crops is um, my, my main heat loving crops don't go in until uh, June. So from April till June, that bed could sit bare or it could sit with mulch on it, or it could have a cover crop that then grows to get six, eight inches tall or more, depending on the season, that then you can cut off. It has been photosynthesizing, it's been feeding your soil, and now it's serving as a mulch around the, the pepper transplant or your tomato transplant. Um, again, here we are. Uh, some interns harvesting the garlic, and there's that that bed again uh, that we I showed you a minute ago of uh, the cover crop already up 
because it, within the day, it's if, if I have time that evening or the next day, I put that cover crop in. And so when you're planting cover crops, you do need to water the seeds if it's dry because they're like any other seed. But once they germinate and get going, uh, they're just like anything else. They don't need a lot of care. Another thing, terrible picture, but what, what it is is under sowing. So if you have tall crops like corn or tomatoes, after the crop is, is, has been growing for a third of its uh, growing time, some maturity, you can plant a cover crop seed under it. And um, this is where we have to stop and say, okay, I've been brought up and taught that competition is bad. And so for growing things, so you can't have a weed, you can't have anything, you just have to have your vegetables because you don't want them competing for water, you don't want them competing for nutrients, or you don't want them competing for sunlight. But that's just flip that over because it's really not true. As long as they're in their own level. Um, so if you plant this cover crop in the, say the corn, uh, it'll start growing, but it won't be tall enough to compete for sunlight with your corn. It will be photosynthesizing, feeding your soil, keeping moisture in the soil, keeping weeds out of the soil. And when the corn dies back, it will shoot up and be taller and be another more biomass again for you to use for mulch. So how do we do this? Um, and I'm gonna go through each of these techniques. So broadcasting is not like we don't have 40 acres where we're out there throwing our seeds to the wind. Uh, it's just a sprinkling technique. And so um, something called frost seeding at this time of year, often if you go out and there's any bare soil or if you pull your mulch back so that you can get uh, the soil to warm up, you'll see those crystals forming as the soil heaves a little bit and makes those fissures. So if you put a cover crop in, um, when the fissures are open during the day, uh, they, they'll close down during the day, I mean, and then open up in the opening and closing it will plant that seed and bury it for you. So it's uh, another labor saving device. And come on. Uh, another way I, I plant those cover crop seeds is through this is uh, winter mulch that was again, probably a foot deep in the fall and is now barely covering the soil. Sprinkle the seeds on top and then take your rake uh, on the right hand side and just shuffle them in so they get down and touch soil. You know, the seeds have to touch soil and they have to be moist. So again, it's not a hard thing and there's some mulch there covering it so you don't have to worry about that. This was an interesting experiment that I did that was really worked well is I had a cover crop again in April. Um, and when I put my transplant of winter squash out, this picture is in July, but I put the uh, transplants out in June. So they're younger. I didn't have, a, didn't take a picture of it, but I, I did something called crimping, which is not cutting off and killing those cover crop plants, it's just pinching them back, like taking a board and whapping them so that it, it breaks their vascular system and it slows them down. And so over on the right, um, you can see those squash are running. They don't have any competition for sunlight, um, but the cover crop is coming back underneath, nourishing the soil as well. Uh, and this is another great way to use them, especially buckwheat. Um, you can get sun scald on your uh, peppers and things like that, or uh, you can get a, a week or two extra of growth on your lettuces and greens because they're shading them. Uh, they're keeping the soil moisture. And, and there's some lettuce. If you look really closely, there's all kinds of different kinds of lettuce in that bed um, and it keeping them cooler for another couple of weeks. And this was just a... Uh, uh, an area that did get out of my hand and it has garden sorrel as you can see and I uh, let it go because it wasn't competing and I used it as a cover crop instead of buying seed. I thought well I'll use a weed that's not hurting anything to photosynthesize and to, to help me uh, and on the right is the uh, cucumber that's going to go up a trellis and so again they won't be in competition. So experiment and see what works for you. 
Okay, so the types of cover crops that I use, and again, these notes are all there, so I'm not gonna read it all to you. Just gonna go through a few. Um, so the tall uh, grass-like thing are the oats and the field peas are just like regular uh, garden peas, only they get really tall. Um, one, one thing people say, well, can you eat any of these things? And yes, those tendrils on the field peas and the, um, uh, are really delicious in a salad or a stir fry. And the oat straw, uh, the greens from the oats, they're really good in a tea. So, um, and those, I'm gonna get to the radish in a minute the, that I showed you earlier. And they're, they are basically daikons. And so, yes, I use those when the daikons aren't there when I wanna make kimchi. Um, buckwheat is really a fantastic uh, cover crop, has big wide leaves, so it really helps um, with the, the uh, mulching and, and keeping the soil moist and suppressing weeds. And it's also an, a major uh, uh, habitat for pollinators and for best beneficial insects. So these little bitty white flowers. And if you keep, I keep them going. So I plant a little buckwheat, even if it's just a small foot or two section of a bed every two weeks so that there's always this flower uh, in for the beneficials to have access to. So that when they finish off the aphids, they won't leave town and go to your neighbor's garden because there's nothing to eat. They have a place to live and they can eat the nectar and they're there in case uh, you get more aphids. And it's just amazing to stand near these things and hear the amount of buzzing and insect life it is just amazing. Okay, so uh, another one that I had uh, have been having great experience with is Sudan grass sorghum. Uh, and they call it a grass, but it looks a lot like corn and has the same kind of root structure as corn. It's a major, major, major biomass producer so that if you're just really want to have a lot of mulch or you really want to add to your compost, uh, there's a certain time and, and when you be cutting it, that it increases the production of it. Um, and that's in the notes. It also suppresses root knot nematodes. So I always make sure I have this cover crop in uh, the bed the year before where I plant my carrots. And it, it really does an amazing job at that. And here we are with the forage radish or another name for daikon. And again, uh, they're edible. But if, you, if you've ever grown them, if you pull one out, um, they can go down into the soil two feet or so. So if you think of you had a hard, a hard pan of clay uh, or a, a really dense soil, that will break through it. And when it dies and decomposes that, it's about two inch, three inch diameter of a, a, a radish. Uh, and that just becomes a pulpy mess that feeds everybody in the soil, but it also becomes your major air uh, and water pathway down into your soil. So depending if you have really compact soil, make sure you put a lot of those in. So two uh, cover crops that I do use that aren't perennial, I mean that are perennial and won't winter kill are white clover and red clover. Um, the Dutch white, and they, they are such good nitrogen fixing. I use them in pathways and on edges so that um, they're always, and sometimes I'll have a whole bed of the white clover and cut it really low and use it as a living mulch and dig back and plant my tomatoes or something in it. Uh, actually, the kale really like that amazing way to do it. And it's fixing nitrogen like crazy all this time. The plant on the left, these roots, um, two things about the roots. This, I pulled this in April, the end of April one year, and you can see uh, that black soil still clinging to it. That's the glomalin. But there wasn't much greenery on top, so it's mostly beautiful roots and glomalin. But here's one that I pulled in August, and it's a little blurry, but these little white sacky kind of things, those are the nodes full of nitrogen. And the green on top of that in August was a huge big clover plant. So Again, the green is producing, working for you besides photosynthesizing it, they're doing other great things. And the more diverse you can make your cover crops, uh, the better because 
everything diversity rules. <laughs> if you, you know, there's some, some microorganisms like one plant roots and one like this and one like that, that might be a, a dry summer, it might be a wet summer, different crops, um, the more you have, the better you'll have something working really well for you. And you can pick mix up your, whatever you're going to be planting due to what your, what your outcome that you want. Me, it's winter kill. So I'm only going to plant things for winter kill. But depending on what your needs are, you might choose another um, way to, to do that. So there are different ways to manage these things. And here we go. Talk fast. So this little tool is a Japanese, little Japanese serrated sickle. Um, it's under 10 bucks. I don't get paid by these people, but I send a lot of people to them. It's uh, over in Conway, Mass, uh, the Orchard Supply Company. It's a really lightweight and that's, I've been using the same one for I don't know how many years and I can cut millions of cover crops really quickly. As long as I don't keep, as long as I keep my thumb out of the way and don't cut that. They can also cut below the soil level. So if you're really trying to kill your cover crop um, instead of just having it grow back, then you cut, and it still doesn't go um, dull very quickly. So something like that is what I use. I like those big scissors kind of thing. Um, too much work for me. Okay, so now this is just part of showing that here is a winter, uh, late fall, we've had the freezes, the whole garden is covered, there's no bare soil anywhere. And we get the nice snow, which is that uh, extra fertilizer. And I'm just gonna run through a quick um, series here of this. This is spring, uh, this area again was a, a time that after garlic and here it is that same bed in the spring and this is that that glomalin shot but this is the soil in that bed uh beautiful beautiful texture and richness to it um okay so another way to, to plant is like i plant my carrots uh late in july because of uh, timing for storage and everything so instead of letting that bed sit there that whole time, I, um, I can plant a cover crop on it. And I'm gonna go through this quickly. So this is April again, here they are germinating. Uh, here's an oat and pea. It was mostly uh, an oat and pea because they, they do better in the cold weather and they won't die. The buckwheat can't be planted until the same time you plant your other warm season crops. Um, very thick. And so here I am cutting it with that tool Look at that soil. Don't you want to just eat it? It's so good. Um, and I pulled up a couple of, of uh, the peas, even though I told you not to, just to show you those nodules, all that free nitrogen. This bed was so rich. Um, so then I, after I cut it, I put it back on the bed because I wasn't ready to, to plant yet. Uh, that all dried out. I took the fork and moved it aside. So I use the digger just to show you for this slide presentation. Um, here's the soil, really, really beautiful stuff. But um, I left it bare because I wanted to have some weeds germinate so that I could, uh, not very many because I don't have that many anymore, but there were some germinating. So I put the solarization on it just for this slideshow. Here you go and killed them off. And then I planted, uh, there's beets in the foreground and carrots uh, in the back. And then I went on vacation. So I did not uh, get other pictures until here. <laughs> so sometimes you need an extra boost. Sometimes the weather, sometimes the whatever. I don't have a picture of the backpack sprayer in the garden, but this is a uh, crew in the orchard early spring, just to show you what it looks like. Um, I make a foliar tea. And again, the, I just take a bucket, a five gallon bucket and walk through the garden and what look for the most vibrant things that are growing um, that I don't want to take and eat. And uh, soak them overnight or for a day or two and then put some fish, liquid fish and liquid seaweed and spray. And not only are you getting nutrients on your plants, you're also getting 
uh, the, the, bio, the biology that was in that composty kind of tea. Uh, you can put some compost or manure in it too to increase that. So when you spray that on the leaves, what you're getting is protection on the leaves too from disease and pests. And sometimes you do have poor depleted soil depending where you're starting from. And you might have to add those minerals, like I said, uh, or add soil biology. And you could go out into the woods to a really healthy wooded area and uh, don't take a lot from the trees, but you can dig down and see that real rich black loamy stuff, um, leaf mold under the trees and bring some of that back and put it in your garden just to give it a, an, a way to inoculate those fungal activity. And if you cover crop intensely and use compost, and like I said, the fungus, fungal uh, food is ligneous mulch, which is the, wood, the woody material in stalks of the oats or, the, or the, the peas or whatever that, the woody stuff that holds your stalks up is what is really important to them. Another, uh, Michael Phillips has a really good book out and I just went blank. It might be Mycorrhizal Planet. Uh, anyway, he, he's, it's a really very good book and you can use your discount at Chelsea Green to get it. Um, but he, he talks a lot about this kind of stuff. But you can buy exp very expensive inoculants to spray in your garden or to, or to water with. But he said a lot of them aren't worth their money that you have to spend on it. And he, he gave a, some of the ones that he's used and experimented with that he thought were worth your money if you want to buy it. Uh, some people like to have how much, if I'm seeding my cover crop, how much do I use? I just wing it with my intuition. But this is a Cornell chart if you want it. All kinds of resources. I, I've been watching a lot of regenerative agriculture uh, videos. So I just thought I'd pop in some of them that you might want to go to and look at. And I'm ending here with um, just, just a, a second for you to take to think about anything that you might want to make a note of that you really want to try doing in your, at your place, in your garden. Uh, and it just encourage you, like I said, to take just even a small section and the results will, will just make you want to do it everywhere. So this photo is a, 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 an heirloom tomato in October 11th. So I used to have my tomato plants and probably, uh, you know, you can drive around and see other people's if you don't, if you don't have them. <laughs> but we're starting in July, late July and August, moving up the plant, the leaves are all yellow, they're brown, they're dying off. And further up the plant uh, is dying. And it's, oh, that's early blight. Everybody has early blight. Um, you can't do much about it. You can try to prevent it this way or that. But you know, that's just life. If you look at that plant, where's that dead dying leaf? There may be one or two there. And I just want to say the reason for that, the reason that uh, early blight or alternaria takes hold is because its job as a bacteria is to decompose sick and dying or dead material. So why are your lower leaves of your tomato plant sick or dead or dying is because um, if your soil doesn't have enough nutrients to feed it, the plant wants to continue its growth on the growing tips. It wants its fruit to mature and have seeds because it wants those babies to live. So I'm gonna steal from the older leaves and give it to those baby leaves and to those fruit. And so if you have healthy soil, they're not, they're, they're not stealing from the bottom leaves. So you don't, the, the disease has nothing to take hold of because they're not sick. They're healthy leaves the whole year long. So this is, uh, to me, proof positive. Anyway, I think uh, I wanna just leave this slide <laughs> up for a second because this is a cover crop with the diversity that can live in an organic regenerative. I love our snakes and they just, they just are everywhere as you can see. So thank you very much for, for letting me uh, be with you this evening and I hope there's some questions that I can answer and if not, uh, we can all do research together. We have some great questions. Thank you everybody for dropping those questions into the chat. Um, there's a whole bunch, so we might not get to all of them. 
I do want to remind you that if you're really enjoying this series that we do appreciate your support. So a small donation or uh, you know, a sustaining membership is a great way to show your support for us. We are going to sort of jump right into the list of questions and that we have gotten so far. I think one thing to think about and that we'd like to start off is uh, when we are choosing to see different cover crops, um, what do we consider as far as timing goes and the selection of cover crops? Could you speak to that? Sure, that's a good question. Um, I kind of skipped over some of that to, to try to fit everything in, but it should be in the notes. But there, there are there are cover crops just like your vegetables that are cold tolerant and hardy, and others that are very sensitive. And so the timing is to figure out which of those are go whenever. Uh, the oats and the peas and the radish are all very tolerant to cold. So I try to get those planted early, uh, late. Uh, I would be out there today if I didn't know, think it might snow again. But uh, sometime in April, I'll start putting those in. And then um, as the season progresses and it's warmer, I can start adding the sorghum and the uh, uh, buckwheat and, and the barley and things like that that are a little more sensitive. Um, and, and people mix in and I've, I've been doing um, sunflower seeds. If I have old vegetable seeds left over, like I, you know, a few years old, the corn seeds have been around a while or the bean seeds have been around. I just throw them in the, the cover crop bucket and throw those out. Some of them will grow, some of them won't, but um, they're all things that will die in the winter and they're all going to photosynthesize. So your timing depends on where you have bare soil and what time of year it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were several questions about how to terminate different crops. Could you just touch again on, on some of your termination methods? I think some folks are interested in how one might plant into a bed with a fresh cover crop. Okay, well, um, that, I use that little tool, and if I if I want, there's two things. If if I want that cover crop to come back up, uh, and and be under the plant, if I'm transplanting into that bed, say I'll cut it really close to the ground, but not all the way uh, below the soil, or I will crimp it by using a you know my hand or a board to mash it down and then I'll put a transplant in, into that area. But if I really don't want that cover crop to be there to be coming back, I can use that little tool and cut below the soil line that where it, the bed that had the carrots in it, where they had the oats and peas that I, I cut, uh, I cut use that little tool just below the soil line and it severed them and so it killed them because their growing apex was a, is above the, the soil line uh, and that, that killed them. You can also um, cut it really close and if you really want to and solarize it for a day uh, and that will help uh, terminate something. But some, um, it's the winter kill to make sure that some of these things will self-seed like buckwheat is a really good one and the radish is a really good one at self-seeding. So if you're worried about that becoming a pest, then make sure you, you cut those off before the seeds mature, I, I let them go because it's free seed. Sometimes I gather it and reuse it. Uh, and sometimes I just let it reseed because they're never a pest to me. I either cut them if they're in the way or smash them down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to add to that, Jessica asked, do you plant your cover crop in the rows or are we like in between rows or is it a little bit of both? I have beds. Uh, and so I plant the cover crop in the whole bed or wherever there's a spot of bare soil anywhere. Uh, in the rows, I either have a lot of mulch or I will put the, the white Dutch clover in the paths. Uh, but I, um, and occasionally I'll have some white Dutch clover in a bed, but usually not. And someone asked if so we could it's, so it's in my vegetable bed that I'm planting the cover crops because I want that soil to be to be you know healthy through the photosynthesis of it and then I either cut them out of the way and when I need that bed 
or I um, let it go for the full year. Mm -hmm. And someone asked if we could use um, old vegetable seeds as perhaps a cover crop. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, as well, uh, someone asked specifically about the color of the nodules on your pea crop. Could you tell us what we might be looking for if we were to look at the nodules a little closer? Uh, on the on the roots, yes, they they're kind of uh, well. After you shake the soil off, they're they're light colored, like a, a beigey light. You know, obviously in the soil they're not going to be white, but um, pretty light colored. Mm -hmm. And someone also asked if you have ever used alfalfa as a cover crop. And then I might add to that, uh, another question came in about, you know, again, sources of nitrogen um, that are not animal based. Do you have any recommend recommendations on maybe a cover crop for nitrogen inputs or uh, some other nitrogen input? Sure. Um, I haven't used alfalfa, so I can't speak to that. Um, my guess is, is that it does not die with the cold weather or I would be using it. Um, so uh, I don't want to turn the soil. I don't want to have to, I know there's things like vetch, amazing. I used to use vetch, but it can also become a, a real hassle in a garden. Unless, I mean, there's certain timing with the vetch and with the rye that if you cut it at the milky stage of the rye kernel or the vetch just as a I'm not, I'm making this up, but I think it's just as it begins to flower, it will kill it. But I can't guarantee that I'm going to notice that and be there to do it. And so to me, uh, I know they're very beneficial, but the ease of knowing that they're going to be killed by the winter negates that for me. And each of you can figure out how it works best for you. What was the rest of that question? Nitrogen. Um, like I've been saying, legumes, uh, beans, peas, uh, field peas, all kinds of legumey things fix nitrogen. They take it from the air and put it, make those nodules on their roots. And then when that plant um, is cut back or dies back, that becomes available in the soil to anybody else that's there. So that's, that's the biggest way to get free nitrogen. Um, the thing about the green manure that I mentioned, that if you plant a cover crop and kill it when it's uh, cut it down, when it's about two to four inches tall and then solarize it, uh, that will give you a nitrogen boost as well. And to switch tack a little bit, some folks might be interested in um, what you said, you, what you started with, with like the lasagna gardens and starting on sort of a bare ground um, someone asked if you were to recommend um, a, a practice for someone who is starting a brand new, brand new garden. Um, you mentioned using perhaps using tarps or solarizing. Um, could you speak again to that and, and, and also add maybe ways that we can avoid using um, plastic tarps in the garden as well? Yeah. Um, let me just do a disclaimer. That's the only time I've ever solarized was because I wanted pictures for the slideshows. Because uh, some people need to have some way to be able to, to, to kill things. And I wanted to experiment with it and do that. So I, I try not to use plastic. Um, the simplest, easiest, most productive way I know to start a new garden is like, say you have sod, where you could dig it all up and move it and then you're losing all your topsoil you're losing all the root matter you're losing all the, any microbes or worms or anything that are there so what you what you do and a lot of people have really put a lot of energy into experimenting and, and there's a lot out there on um, youtubes and stuff is put down the cardboard right on top of your sod if it's t if the grass is tall mow it put down your cardboard a layer or two thick make sure it overlaps so that um it helps prevent things from growing up. And then layer your organic matter, um, three, four inches of, you know, whatever you have. If you have chipped leaves are, are really excellent. Uh, whole leaves are, are harder. You can use them if that's all you have. Run the lawnmower with a bagger over it. Um, 
leaves are really good, old rotten hay or straw, wood chips, uh, compost, uh, cow or horse or whatever manure if you have access to poultry. That's one of the reasons we raised poultry so that we would have a little bit of animal input uh, because I, I do think it is it is helpful to have animal manure uh, in the in the garden, especially a, a, a ruminant. So because when when cows and goats and those guys uh, do their uh, rumination, they're chewing their cud. There's all kinds of microbes involved in that whole process. So when they poop it out, that 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 really helps inoculate your garden too. So it's just a layering of those kind of things, and you want to end up with something on top that will keep the sun from baking it. So to keep it the nice and moist and then you water it, but not till it's sopping wet, but you do want to keep it so it's like a sponge. Uh, and you just do that for, um, like I said, a, a few weeks before you start planting in it. If you make a hole and fill it with compost and put a tomato or whatever in or a seed, it will grow. If you wait, uh, six weeks or six, like six months, you don't, won't need to do that. You can just you know, plant your things directly in it, but it is decomposing, so it's making heat. So you don't wanna put uh, roots or you know, seedling right into a bed that you've just made because it'll fry it. So that's why you wanna move it back and put it into compost. And um, could you speak a little bit, a bit about how you use cardboard in any of your, your bed systems? Uh, basically, I use it for the base base layer to help um, smother what's there that I don't want. It's also, for some reason, uh, earthworms just love it. it uh, my friend Ra uh, Ricky Baruch over at Season Solidarity Farm calls it a, 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 a worm sex generator or something. I don't remember, but it's just if you put cardboard down and keep it nice and moist by layering these things on it, and then look under there. It's just, you know, it's like big worms, little worms, baby worms, all kinds of things. So, um, the other thing I didn't mention, but when I, when I started my garden 40 years ago down in the other farm, uh, I did buy myself uh, $40 worth of red wrigglers. So back then it was probably more you know, inflation, it might cost more, but I just took a handful and put them in different beds um, to help with that deco decomposition. Um, we also put them in, the, in our compost toilet uh, to help decompose. And they say, well, those red wrigglers will not survive the winter. They've been there four years uh, and they're very happy. So, so cardboard is basic is it's our base layer uh, on, every, on everything, but you can also use it just to smother areas uh, and not necessarily layer up and plant on it, but to keep the weeds down. Mm -hmm. And several folks have asked if the these um, cover crops and no-till practices can work for small or, um, you know, container gardens, um, so a little bit smaller space. Have you had experience with that? I haven't had that experience, though I've had that question. Um, I just don't do container gardening, so I don't know. I think um, I think there's no reason it couldn't work. But if you have like small containers, like five gallon buckets or whatever, there's not a whole lot of room. So, but if you're talking about maybe bigger containers, like a, a watering tank size or something, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Because you're just conditioning the soil and you're wanting photosynthesis to happen constantly as much as possible. Yeah. Um, a couple of folks are interested in, there's a couple of folks interested in ways maybe to use comfrey as perhaps uh, a mulch or in, in your garden to use comfrey. I do, I love comfrey. Um, and we didn't move enough of it over, so I'm going to have to go back to the new folks and dig some up this this year and put it around. Uh, mostly, I use it for a couple of things: is, is I make teas out of it because it's just so good for um, the garden, and then I can either water with it or spray with it. Um, I also 
we had so much of it that I did. I would just take armfuls and um, use it as mulch ar around plants if I didn't have other mulch. And also just as a layer in the compost pile is another great green carbon layer to, to help heat it up. Mm -hmm. Great. There, I, there are varieties of com uh, comfrey and some are really spread like crazy and others are more contained. Um, depending on the size of your garden and what you want, you might want to look into what the varieties are that are more contained. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other herb, if I may, that is essential is uh, nettles, stinging nettles. Um, not only are they good for us to eat when they're little in the spring as a tonic and, and a good tea, but again, they are amazing uh, making a tea for the garden itself. And um, I used to have, and sometimes still do, on, on only grow pole beans. Um, so most of my garden has permanent trellises in it because it helps when you're getting older on your knees. It also gives the, the plant a lot more ventilation and it's easier to pick. Um, and my, my uh, it's, I used to use like a chicken wire, but then you can't get through to get the thing you really want on the other side. So if you can afford it or can fi uh, find them anywhere, uh, reinforcing uh, wire for concrete floors has six inch squares and you can reach through it and it's a fantastic trellis. I, I have everything that possible goes on a trellis. Now, why did I say, what was I talking about trellises? Oh, so my beans uh, sometimes start getting a little like rusty color on their leaves. And if I make a, a comfrey nettle tea with, um, with other, you know, whatever else is growing and, and some of the fish and seaweed and spray it, it's gone. It's really amazing whatever those, those herbs have. The horsetail too, for some reason, our farm can't grow it. I have to go borrow it from friends, but it's a real, another good. Um, some folks are talking about red clover and is, do you know much about red clover? Is that a perennial clover? It's actually a biennial, but it seeds itself. And so it's like a perennial, um, you know, it can go uh, everywhere and I love it. And I, I'll see where they are come spring and if I need to plant in that area, I'll cut it off below the soil and it won't come back. Uh, nitrogen is going into the soil, but if it's in a place that I'm not gonna be planting in, I leave it and then it'll self seed. And then next year there'll be more here and there all over. So I do use it, but I don't plant it specifically in any one place. And a lot of, a lot of the, flowers and odd things in my garden find their own path. Uh, uh, calendula will be in one section one year and the next year it's over all by itself, three beds away. And, you know, it just, they move and they think, well, if I don't need that spot and I want to be there, fine. Uh, I, I try to work with one of the things uh, I do do is work with uh, the plant divas, plant spirits, uh, and I think it's been a co-creation process of working on a different level that I'm not out there putting my thumb on and controlling everything, but trying to be cooperative. And uh, many years ago, I read uh, about uh, this woman who was trying to work with the plant spirits and she was work, you know, she gathered up some bunch of insects and she, uh, took them, you know, a quarter of a mile away and came back and then she was meditating with the, the spirits and they said, not to worry, they'll be back. It's like, it's like with Buddha, you know, a, a Buddhist monk that the fly fell into the tea and the Westerner was, oh my God, there's a fly in your tea. And the, the monk just took it out and, oh, you'll be better. It will, it will live. So try it have that feeling in, in my garden made a big difference from when I would walk out. I know this is not on topic, but I'm going with it anyway. I would walk out and see, I had a squish, I had a kill, I had a kill, I had a kill. 
that was just this whole kill mentality. But once, once this diversity evolved and my brain evolved and heart evolved to be uh, let things come into balance, I have not had huge outbreaks of Mexican bean beetles or those, I still get squash bugs that are tempting. Or, you know, I have to stop myself and sometimes I can't stop myself. But um, just to have that feeling of wanting to have balance, the balance has, has happened. I think that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, and we have one more question. Uh, would you, do you have recommendations for um, sources for cover crop seeds? Oh yes, a Nova Mass bulk order. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't speak to the types of seeds and stuff, but the, I, I would say uh, definitely the Nova Mass bulk order because they're organic. And uh, your local farmers supply I live near Greenfield, Mass, and um, I started giving these talks a few years ago, and I was at the counter one day, and, and the manager says, Sharon, all these people are coming in wanting to know about cover crop seeds. What do you want me to get? So he now orders organic cover crop seeds for people um, to be able to get them at, at a regular conventional farmer supply. So approach your local sources. That You can also, there are mail orders from... Peaceful Valley, I think if you Google it, you'll find a, a number of sources. And the reason I'm stressing the organic is because I used to think, eh, you know, it's nice, I'm organic, I wanna be organic, but God, sometimes the prices are so much higher. Should I really go out of my way to try to find it? And one of my interns went on to get her PhD in seeds. <laughs> uh, and she explained to me that, you know, it's like, um, it's, it's like if you grow up as, a, as a, a kid and a teenager just on sugar, 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 um, that's, that's how you grow. That's what you need. That's the nutrient you need is junk food. And so you take a plant or a seed that has just been used to being fed uh, out, uh, fed fertilizer sources, from, not from the soil, but from an outside source it doesn't know how to really, it takes that plant a lot longer to learn to work with the soil and the soil microorganisms where a plant that has grown uh, and been grown for generations as organic has that in its makeup to know that this, I'm not gonna get sprayed with 10, 10, 10, you know, I gotta do it myself. I'm a homesteader, I gotta do it myself. So organic seeds, organic plants when you can, uh, and another, another thing, please try not to buy your starts, your tomatoes and things from big box stores, support your local farm and don't bring in diseases from down south. That's where the winter, I mean, the late blight came from a few years ago that was so devastating. So think local, buy local, think organic, support NOFA. I used to be a board and staff in NOFA, so I can say this, they do use your money wisely, and we really need it to um, get education out there. So be generous. <laughs> that is very generous of you, Sharon. Thank you so much. I want to respect all of our time. It's 8.30. We look forward to seeing you next time. And from everyone at NOFA Mass, have a great night. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, everyone.